We're now moving into our discussion of histology, which is the study of tissues. So previously we talked about cells and when we covered cytology, remember cells get together and form the next level of organ organization, which is called tissues. So that's what we're going to be talking about in this lecture. So a little bit about tissues in general. It's a group of similar cells that carry out a similar function. And there's four types in the human body, and that's it. So there's epithelial, there's connective, there's muscle, and there's nervous. So any other uh, substance in the body can fit into those one of those categories. So we're going to spend the bulk of our discussion in this lecture talking about epithelial and connective. And then we're actually going to cover muscle and nervous. We'll just touch on them here, and then we will do multiple chapters on each of those later in the semester. So epithelial tissues... They uh, line body surfaces and cavities. A great example is the skin, so body surface or the lining of your stomach. So one or more layers of closely packed cells. Functions are going to be protection, selective permeability, letting certain things through, not letting other things through. Secretions, so think of like maybe sweat glands. Uh, and sensations, your ability to feel touch. So characteristics of epithelial tissues. So cellularity just means they have a lot of cells. Polarity means the cells are different on each side. They're not usually completely symmetrical. Like with epithelial tissues, one side is generally attached to something called the basement membrane, and then the other side is free, and you'll see that. Um, so attachment, like I just said, they're attached to a surface commonly known as the basement membrane. They're avascular, meaning epithelial tissue does not have a blood supply. Innervation means there's a nervous tissue that innervates the epithelial tissue. So you have nerves, for example, in the skin, so you can feel things. High regenerative capacity, the epithelial tissues can regenerate really quickly, so their cells can divide and reproduce quickly. So think of your skin again. If you get a a scrape or a cut, it usually heals pretty quick. So if we look at this picture, we're seeing epithelial tissue here. In this case, there's only one layer of cells, so closely packed cells. So what I want to point out here is one surface is exposed, the other surface is attached. The attached surface is commonly known as the basal surface, and the, the top that's exposed is called the free surface, also known as the apical surface. And so this is that basement membrane I was referring to. So epithelial tissues are attached to something called the basement membrane. There's two layers. There's a basal lamina, which is more superficial, and reticular lamina, which is a little bit deeper. All of this down here would be connective tissue. So uh, remember, epithelial tissue does not have blood vessels, but that's why you see a blood vessel here, because this is connective tissue, which we'll talk about after epithelial. So the cells in epithelial tissue are held closely together, and there's types of junctions that hold them together. There's four types, uh, and we're going to talk about those right now. So tight junction, adhering junction, desmosomes, and gap junctions. So we're going to start with tight junctions. So a couple of key points. They attach cells together via membrane proteins near the apical or free surface. So these are going to be away from that basement membrane. And it holds the cells cl very close together. So a good example is, uh, would be like the bladder where you don't want anything to seep through. Uh, so closely, close connections, tight. That's why they're called tight junctions. So looking at this picture, so you get one row of cells right here. These, these proteins up here that are holding the cells together, these are your tight junctions. And if you look at this picture right here, there's a close up. So proteins that hold cells together near the apical surface. Next we have adhering junction. These are a little bit deeper to uh, deeper than tight junctions and they form a belt and the belt goes around the entire cell. So they don't hold the cells together quite as tight but if I go back to this picture you can see an adhering junction. See this belt that's formed around the cell? That's an adhering junction. And if you look, zoom in right here, here's that adhesion belt I was referring to. So these are always going to be deep to the tight junctions. So desmosomes are a type of cell-to-cell -cell junction. 
that hold cells together and they form a plaque. And what I mean by that is just like a big kind of glob of proteins. And there's filaments on the inside of the cell that attach there also. So remember there's a cytoskeleton inside the cell and some of those uh, structures of the cytoskeleton were called intermediate filaments. So those stick into the plaque and help anchor uh, and support the cell. But they also uh, attach, the plaque also attaches uh, to another cell. So it basically uh, holds cell, not only does it help with the structure of a cell, but it also holds the cells together. Now, interestingly about the desmosomes, unlike the tight junctions or adhering junctions, they don't go all the way around the cell. They're only found at specific points where they're stressed. So if I go back to this picture, you can see a desmosome here and another one here. This is what it would look like close up. So you get the uh, plaque, which is this thing right here, and your intermediate filaments from the cytoskeleton attaching. And then lastly, we have gap junctions. Gap junctions are basically form a gap between cells. And so a gap is formed between cells by proteins called connexons. And so six connexons form an opening between two adjacent cells. And the benefit of this is that it allows the cells to rapidly communicate with each other. So you find gap junctions where you want cells to work closely together. A great example is the heart. The heart cells work closely together so they can all contract at the same time or a similar point in time. And so if I go back to this picture, Here's a gap junction. These are actually several gap junctions, but if you zoom in on one of these, you can actually see those little six little proteins. Those are the connexons forming the gap junction. And it, things can flow right through from cell to cell to allow the cells to rapidly communicate with each other. All right, so classifications of epithelial tissue. They're named by the number of layers of cells that are present and also the shape. So as far as the number of layers, if it's only one layer of cells, it's classified as simple. If it's more than one layer, it's called stratified. If it looks stratified and it's not, it's called pseudo stratified. And there's only, there's one specific example of this, which we'll talk about. As far as the shape, the shape only refers to the outer layer. So if there's multiple layers of epithelial tissue, you're, it's named according to the outermost or most superficial layer of cells. So if they're flat, if the cells are shaped like flat or wide cells, they're called squamous. If they look like little cubes, they're called cuboidal. If they look tall, uh, like a column, they're called columnar. And then there's one example uh, where the shape actually can change and that's called transitional. So you're gonna see that in the urinary bladder. When it stretches out, they kind of look flat. When it's not stretched out, it looks more rounded. So flat cells, squamous, one layer, simple. So this would be simple squamous, multiple layers here. So this would be stratified. And if we wanted to look at, if we wanted to look by shape, if we look at the outermost layer, these look flat. So I would classify this as uh, stratified squamous. All right, so what we're gonna do now is run through all of the epithelial tissues that you need to be able to know about and then also identify. So we're gonna start with simple squamous based on its name, one layer, flat cells on the outside. So found, find this where the little friction abrasion occurs. So generally you find this where you want things to get across. So, so great example are the air sacs in the lungs, which are called alveoli. They have simple squamous. Uh, to allow oxygen and carbon dioxide to get across. Blood vessels, the inner lining, I should say, of blood vessels, which is called the endothelium. That is simple squamous. And then serous cavities that we've discussed, the serous membranes, that's simple squamous epithelium, and it's called the mesothelium. So this is supposed to be an air sac in the lungs, and you see one layer of flat cells. So we will discuss this uh, in, a, in one of the lab videos. We'll see some more microscope slides of all of these. All right, simple cuboidal, one layer, cube-shaped cells. So big place we have these is the kidney. Uh, that's probably the number one place we have this. 
And so it may look a little bit different depending on how you're looking at it. So this is actually a longitudinal section of a kidney tubule. So you're actually seeing two. You got to envision that this is one tube, but since you, they cut it longitudinally, it, you, you've seen it twice. So one layer, cube-shaped cells, simple cuboidal. Number one place it's found is a kidney. If you saw a cross-section of this, it would look a little bit different. So simple columnar, one layer, column-shaped cells. And find this mainly in the digestive tract. And so if you look at this, one layer, column-shaped cells. Other structures associated with this tissue include microvilli, which increase the surface area. And this is what we would call a brush border that's found in the digestive tract. So microvilli are there forming a brush border. And then uh, these big cells are called goblet cells. Goblet cells secrete mucus, commonly found in simple columnar epithelium. And so notice that I've said non-ciliated. There is another form of simple columnar that is, that is cili ciliate, that has cilia, so it's ciliated. If it has cilia, it's not going to have the microvilli. For in this course, we're going to focus mainly on the uh, simple columnar that's non-ciliated that has the microvilli. So keep that in mind. So as far as the ciliated version, you can just know that it exists, but we're not really going to see it any more than just mentioning it. All right, so stratified squamous. So multiple layers with outer layer is flat. So um, basal layer has stem cells, and what stem cells do is rapidly divide. So what you're going to see, and this is a great example of this, is the skin. And we do have a couple of other places in the body. Uh, may or may not have a protein called keratin. That's going to give us two subtypes of this. We can have keratinized stratified squamous or non-keratinized stratified squamous. Keratin is just a protein that helps protect the tissue. So we're going to start with keratinized. So this is what your skin is. So it's keratinized stratified squamous. So what happens here if we kind of zoom in i'll zoom in on this one so or i'll focus on this one so you can kind of see what's going on so all of this from here to here make up the stratified squamous epithelium and what we have is you can see how it looks like it's changing halfway so there's stem cells down here these stem cells rapidly divide and they migrate this way and when they get to the top they get brushed off so this is why your skin can regenerate so quickly because there's all these cells that are constantly dividing down here that move up towards the surface. And the other thing, since this is keratinized, at about this point right here, the, pro the cells fill with keratin and they die. So the, the cells that you're actually seeing on the skin are actually going to be dead. And so they fill with keratin, so keratin really dries them out. That's why your skin's dry. And, uh, but it also kills the cells, so these are all dead cells going up to the surface. So alive, dead. The non-keratinized version is, I should go back for one second. So um, location-wise, I just said the skin. I should be more specific here. It's specifically the epidermis of the skin. So your skin has two layers, and this will be our next lecture. The Epidermis is all this that we were just talking about. The dermis is down here, which is completely different. It's actually connective tissue. So keep that in mind. When I say skin, I was specifically referring to the epidermis of the skin for stratified squamous epithelium. All right, as far as the non-keratinized version of stratified squamous, it looks similar, but there's no keratin. So the cells still migrate this way towards the surface, but they don't fill with keratin, so the cells are actually still alive when they reach the surface, and they're gonna be more moist. So great examples, the inside of your mouth, the oral cavity, like in lining of your cheeks, pharynx, so your throat, esophagus, and vagina. Those are all great examples of stratified squamous epithelium that's non-keratinized. Then we have pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So remember, pseudostratified means falsely stratified, and all cells are going to touch the basement membrane down here, but not all reach the surface. So when you look at this, it gives the appearance of multiple layers, but it's still actually one layer. 
And so there'll be goblet cells that secrete mucus here. For our purposes, the pseudostratified columnar is always going to have cilia. Great example of this is all through your respiratory tract, starting up in your uh, nasal cavity, then moving down your uh, trachea and down even further. You're going to have uh, the lining of your airways are going to be lined with this tissue that has cilia. So any dust particles or anything that get into the respiratory tract can be moved out by the cilia and also with the help of the goblet cells secreting mucus to help track, uh, trap it. All right, transitional, remember changes shape. So for identification purposes, it's usually shown in the non-stretched out state. So the cells on the surface look rounded. So I always like to think rounded or dome shaped cells on the surface. So places we have transitional epithelium, the bladder, the urinary bladder, and the ureters, which are also part of your urinary system. So think urinary bladder can stretch out. All right, so those are the major types of epithelial tissues that we need to know, but we need to talk briefly about glandular epithelium. So there are glands associated with the epithelial, t epithelial tissue. These are gonna be what we call exocrine glands. So endocrine glands are totally different. We'll do a whole chapter on the endocrine system. Those are the ones that secrete hormones. Exocrine glands secrete substances that are not hormones. They don't go into the blood. They usually go to the surface and they pass through some type of duct like this. So a great example, like a sweat gland, secretes sweat that ends up on the surface of your skin. So exocrine, exocrine glands have a duct, conducting portion, and then a sinus, which is the part that actually secretes the substance. And structurally, we can classify these glands as unicellular if it's one cell. Technically, a goblet cell would be an example of this. Or multicellular, which is similar to the picture I just showed you. It has a duct and a secretory portion. So naming-wise, if it has one duct and it doesn't branch, it's called simple. If it has multiple ducts that branch, it's called compound. If the secretory portion looks like a tube, it's called tubular. If it looks more like a flask or kind of rounded, it's called a center. So here's some pictures of what I was talking about. So both of these have one uh, duct that doesn't, no branching, so these are called simple. These both have ducts that branch, compound. The other thing, this looks, the secretory portion looks like a tube, so it's tubular. Same here, so simple tubular, compound tubular. Then more rounded. That's a center, so simple a center, compound a center. Functionally, we can classify the exocrine glands uh, as by how they secrete stuff. So merocrine, also known as ecrine, holocrine, and apocrine. So we're going to talk about what those terms mean. So merocrine, in a merocrine gland, they secrete the substance, substance via exocytosis. That's the key word. So merocrine, merocrine glands or ecrine glands, as they're sometimes called, secrete substances via exocytosis. Great example is, are your sweat glands. Holocrine glands secrete substances after the cell dies. So basically what happens is the cells and the secretory portion fill with whatever is going to be secreted and then they disintegrate. And when, they, when the cells break down, they release their substance into the duct. Great example of this are, some, or, are oil glands in the skin. So holocrine, the cell dies, releases the substance. Example is going to be oil glands. Then lastly, apocrine glands are uh, the substances in the cell again, and the apical portion of the cells are pinched off. And that causes the substance to be released. So they're called, think apocrine, apical portion of the cell, like you can see right here, is pinched off, and then the substance is released. So example, the mammary glands. 